<laughs> okay, so um, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, a lot of great talks this morning, particularly Fred's. I was worried the whole morning he was going to steal my thunder. Thankfully, he talked about the mail, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about Tez. Um, I actually did this talk uh, as a keynote at a Drupal conference recently. Um, you're all supposed to cheer when I say Drupal. Um, and I actually used this as the cover, Enterprise Software Development, More Meetings Than Releases, because I think that's a good, f a good test for your company. If you, uh, if you add up the number of meetings you have in every week as an engineer, and definitely include those forced stand-ups you have to go to with your Scrum Master, if you have more meetings than you release to, to production, you're definitely an enterprise company. Um, I actually got tweeted at that, at that conference saying, Clifton Cunningham, O'Reilly author. I'm clearly not an O'Reilly <laughs> author. <laughs> so uh, let's keep going. Maybe not. There we go. Uh, so who am I? I'm a CTO at Tez. I was a CTO at the Mail Online before that. Um, I've been writing software not quite as long as Fred, but certainly for a long time. Um, the thing that gets me out of, the, out of bed in the morning is, is running great teams and building great things. Uh, I'm still very hands-on. I write a lot of code. Uh, I support a lot of our open source projects at Tez. Uh, some of you may have seen me speak at NoConf a couple of years ago about a couple of internal tools that we've open sourced, Bosco, that helps kind of manage some of the complexity around microservices, a little bit like the Taylor tool that was mentioned earlier, uh, but our take on it, uh, as well as a composition proxy that we use to, to pull microservices together. Um, Today, actually, I'm not going to talk about tech much. Uh, I figure there's been some great talks that have really focused on what containers are, and I understand there's even more good talks to come. Um, so today, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about Tez as a business and some of the transformation and cultural elements uh, of what we've been through. So who is Tez? Uh, you might, if you're, if, you're in the UK, if you're a person in the UK, you might recognize it more as the Times Education Supplement uh, and its sister publication, the Times Higher Ed. Uh, so, Tez is yet another 100-year-old publisher. Uh, it got split off from uh, News Corp about a decade ago into private equity ownership, and since then has basically been launching itself effectively as a digital network for teachers uh, and education professionals. So basically what we do, uh, if you visit tez.com today, what you'll see is pretty much a set of services that encompass everything a teacher does. Finding a job, finding a lesson plan, selling lesson plans to each other, uh, complaining about the latest reading SATs test in our community. Uh, there's education news, so we still publish a weekly magazine. Uh, we also have a whole range of CPD online courses and other things. So basically, if you're a teacher in the UK or even internationally, uh, then TES is some way that you go to, uh, to become a better teacher. So uh, day by day, I'm, in, I'm restoring the karma I lost being the CTO at the Daily Mail. Uh, the THE uh, is a very similar business. I won't touch on that, but basically that's a, a pretty much a pure play data business. We run the World University rankings, and behind that we, uh, we sell uh, a whole pile of data and consultancy services, pure data science basically, to try and help uh, universities attract international students. The higher you go up the rankings, the more money you get. So uh, what did TES look like when I started? Um, I left the mail about two years ago, and you've sort of got to think, you know, at the mail, Fred and I went through quite a journey, you know. The organization when I first turned up was quite special and unique. It was quite a very kind of aggressive culture in some respects, not, not of particularly high quality in terms of what they're outputting. And, you know, one of the things that Fred and I really focused on was not just building a high-performing team, but also a, a sort of a sustainable, high-performing culture that really focused on building great products and getting things done quickly. Uh, so I feel like we achieved that at the mail. I then walked out and walked into an organization that had had pretty much no technology investment for a decade. Um, so Tez in the beginning, uh, when I started, uh, everything was Microsoft. Uh, I don't have a thing against Microsoft, particularly with all the .NET Core stuff now, but this is, we were, we were literally a decade old. So I had the entire production infrastructure running on Windows 2003. Um, I think the best way to describe the culture is pretty much that kind of uh, fear-based traditional enterprise where the executive had absolutely no idea what technology was. They had absolutely no idea how to uh, prioritize or control, whatever that means, uh, their technology investments. And as a result, they kind of moved from strategic project to strategic project, making huge investments in technology and getting pretty much nothing out of it, certainly nothing strategic. Uh, all this while, they actually had like a nucleus of really simple products that 
for, you know, for, for some unknown reason, teachers actually really loved. So we had a forum that uh, had huge levels of engagement. Uh, on the back of that forum, teachers had pretty much self-produced a lesson sharing platform that had grown to about a million downloads a day. Um, so uh, insane sort of uh, traffic levels. Uh, all of this completely and utterly in spite of its technology stack. Um, so it's fair to say, I think, um, it's easy to walk into an organization like this and just say, Everything that came before is garbage. We're going to get rid of it all. Uh, you have to be slightly more subtle than that. There were clearly things that were valuable. Um, and you know, the key thing here is that in these sort of organizations, obviously, most of the engineers who are there are just trying to do a good job. Um, and to a certain extent, what they've produced is a, more of a byproduct of their environment than a byproduct of their skills. What did the teams look like? This may be familiar to you. You may have all these titles. Fred and I got rid of some of these at the mail, but they were all existed at TES when I joined. Um, probably the key thing to take away from this is there's pretty much more people with manager in their title than without. Um, and again, this comes from that very traditional enterprise view, which says, you know, uh, technology's scary. Um, we're not quite sure whether all this investment is going to work. We're not quite sure whether we're going to get the results that we expect. These people talk differently to us. They dress differently. So we're going to wrap this veneer of process around them. Uh, and try and use that to make sure that we get what we want. Um, I'm partially to blame for that. I used to work for Accenture. I used to sell managed outsourcing deals. Uh, I helped sell one to ITV, which, I, again, I've been slowly restoring my karma for. So I, I'm, I, feel that I'm, I feel that I'm well qualified to talk about the implications of these sort of structures. Um, so what, what was the challenge? Um, so I got brought in as a CTO of this company. Uh, it's private equity owned. Um, for anyone who knows private equity, you've basically got five to seven years to turn a business around. Um, and the good, pro the good PE firms basically focus on genuinely adding value versus asset stripping. I'm not going to talk about those. Uh, thankfully, TPG bought TES. TPG is firmly focused on sort of digital transformation and delivering value. So I got given uh, both investment and a window. Uh, and that window is about 18 months. So within 18 months, uh, the challenge I had was to basically replatform uh, and transition TES into a business where it was successful because of its technology and it had a foundation for growth as an international business. Who thinks that's possible? Yeah. Okay, so where are we today? TLDR. Today, every single part of our platform is deployed on Amazon. Uh, we have nothing left in the legacy data center, and actually I shut it down about three weeks ago, uh, which has gained us a huge amount of uh, OPEX cost back. Everything is deployed as microservices. We have some mini monoliths, as we like to call them. The biggest of those mini monoliths is Drupal. Uh, we, you know, we use Drupal as a kind of uh, effectively CMS API, um, mostly because we, we can put it in the hands of journalists and editorial people, and uh, they're familiar with it. Uh, everything we do in both those stacks, actually, both Drupal and Node, we do via continuous delivery. Um, we have immutable infrastructure, blue-green deployments, which I'll come to. Uh, we're hugely invested in open source as both users and contributors back. Mostly, most of that's in Node, but we also have, pardon me, uh, some core contributors to Drupal 8 working for us now. Um, and I think the key thing is we've managed to move from this kind of fear-based culture where uh, you know, every, every decision was made at the top. There was a huge veneer and kind of uh, bureaucracy uh, surrounding the way things worked at TES into this kind of concept of small empowered teams. So. What's the recipe? Imagine you're in the same position. You get headhunted to be CTO of a company like Tez. Uh, what would I recommend the tools are? Um, and some of these, the previous talkers have touched on. Uh, so I'm not going to go into a huge amount of depth around some of these things. And keep in mind, I did this talk at a Drupal conference. So some of these things were mind blowing for them. For you guys, it's probably a little bit more passe. The first of these Fred touched on this morning. And I can't, I can't talk enough about how important it is to always think uh, and focus in on just, just how your engineering processes work. And for me, uh, past my experience at the mail, I think this, this sort of approach of either agile plus plus, programmer anarchy, call it whatever you like, um, but certainly these small empowered teams is definitely my go-to technique. And what does that look like? Um, basically, it looks like this. Um, one change, I think, from, uh, from when Fred and I did it at the mail, I've definitely retained the UX design role, and I'll come, I'll come back to that. That's, that's a separate and key role. Um, I also retained the project manager, which some of you may find a bit strange. 
but I actually retain Fred's definition of a project manager more of a concierge, you know, someone who solves problems for the team versus uh, is there to directly manage them and tell them what to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, the engineers. Um, the biggest benefit of doing this, of course, apart from the fact that suddenly you now have you know, a, a clear focus of uh, where, where the responsibility lies, is you save a shed load of money, right? <laughs> Pretty much anybody with, anybody with manager in their name are probably being paid too much. Um, so the instant thing that you do here is you, you, can, you, can, you can prove to your, your board um, that you're you know, a very cost-focused CTO. You can go and cut some costs. Um, and then, of course, immediately reinvest that back into uh, getting more people into the teams that matter, which is engineering. So how does that work in practice? Um, we sort of end up with a, with a sort of a view here. The green box around the outside is what we refer to as a table. I think Fred used this term earlier. Um, I think basically the, ta the table is a small group of people, not dissimilar to, I think Adrian touched on this kind of five plus or minus two. It's the same sort of scale that we operate at, um, where that table contains the engineers, uh, a single UX and or designer. I think some more complex things, we may end up with multiple people in that role, especially at the start as we sort of bootstrap things. Uh, the customer is part of it. We don't set these up unless there's somebody who can represent the customer as part of that team. Uh, we pretty much, you know, I'd say 70 to 80% of the time, we force the customer to come and sit with the team. Um, and if that means I have to absorb the cost of backfilling someone, then we do. And then finally, there's the project manager at the bottom who basically makes sure, make sure that everybody's happy. Does everybody have a computer? Is everybody turning up to work? Uh, does everybody know where the coffee is? Um, and all these other important things. Uh, I think the key thing here is uh, these three roles at the top are the three important ones. Um, and if you get it right, uh, you can do away with the rest. Um, and obviously, the, kind of the, the, the question of leadership changes over time. So it may very well be that at the very start of the project, uh, the kind of leadership role kind of fits actually in the UX design piece because you're, you're trying to rapidly iterate and think about what the solution to the problem might be. And in that instance, what I found is typically building something that kind of works, be that a walking skeleton from a tech perspective or even an interactive prototype you can put in front of users um, is immeasurably uh, beneficial in terms of getting the requirements out so that engineers can start building. And then as things transition, what you tend to find is the engineers then take over, UX and design takes a bit of a back seat uh, and you start shipping product. How do we, how do we organize ourselves uh, outside of that? Um, we have the concept of tables. Uh, TES isn't huge, so uh, my engineering team, I have about 20, 20 engineers in London, about 10 in San Francisco, and four or five uh, remote. So they work all over the world. We have a remote first culture. Um, so some of these tables are entirely remote. We have a view, we have a, an approach with remote development, which is uh, remote teams are all remote. We don't have remote teams who are partially in the office. That, that hasn't worked for us. Um, but we do have some tables who are entirely remote. Um, and we actually try and keep the teams together. I think initially at the mail, uh, we tried to rotate, force rotate people a little. Um, in the end, actually, what I found is it's better to rotate the work that goes through the tables but keep the teams together and just allow people to move uh, as and when they feel they need a change. Okay, programmer anarchy. It may seem a bit crazy, but if you get the opportunity to try it even for a smaller project or some variant of it that works for your organization, I'd highly recommend it. Next up, immutable infrastructure. I think we've talked about this quite a bit today. Um, I think this is an important element in any cultural transformation. Um, and one of the things I didn't touch on in that previous slide in terms of roles uh, was the kind of traditional operations team. Um, I mean, most enterprises have an operations team of some sort, call it whatever you like, th of which engineering will hand over code and instructions and that team will go and deploy stuff. I mean, I think, um, apologies, I can't remember his name, I think it was Keith from Red Hat talked about an operations team upgrading the JDK across a set of containers. I mean, for me, I think that's an anti-pattern. I actually think the teams themselves need to have that responsibility. So the first thing that immutable infrastructure provides you, in my mind, uh, is the confidence to do away with that operations team. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that you've basically massively reduced the, uh, the risk of change. So no one's logging into servers. There's no magic that some team has in their head about how things are configured. Everything's automated all the time. All of the uh, changes to infrastructure, we do via blue-green deployments. We have a, a sort of a view, we call them platform servers. It's effectively, you can think of it as kind of the, uh, 
the things that something like Mesos or, or Kubernetes would control, but effectively the things upon which containers are deployed. Uh, we flip those blue-green, and separately we can flip the things that are, uh, that are effectively slower moving. So we have a huge MongoDB cluster that's actually a shared tenancy, so a number of services will use that. Um, and uh, that can be flipped blue-green separately. Um, we found that much easier to support than a plethora of MongoDB instances. Obviously, your mileage may vary depending on what your organization looks like. Um, and services like, you know, we use Solar heavily, so we have a single kind of major Solar cluster that, that uh, each of the teams interact with, um, all logically separated on that cluster. So we have that kind of combination of containers that move very quickly and are completely controlled and effectively platform services that move a little bit slower, but we get that shared that benefit of shared ownership. Um, so the benefits are obvious. Everything's versioned in GitHub. So I can see every single change that happens to my infrastructure. We use CloudFormation a lot for this. And we have a tool actually which we're about to open source which helps us manage those CloudFormation templates. Uh, everything's auditable, nothing by hand. Uh, we can also roll things back, which is a, you know, we've had to use a few times. Um, no downtime deployments. And this concept, uh, which we have at Tez, which is we refer to as platform ops. I know Google and others probably refer to it as site reliability engineers and things like that. But basically, this is just a team that ensures that the platform that the engineers deploy onto is up. So do the networks work? Uh, is it secure? Uh, our CDNs changing IP addresses all the time. So let's ensure our ELBs have the right IP addresses. Um, and the same idea here is that the platform team uh, are firmly, un they firmly understand that their customer is the engineers. Okay, so the engineers have responsible for the applications, the platform team's customer are the engineers, not the business. <coughs> Next, continuous delivery. So how do we go about that at Tez? Um, again, we've, we've tried to keep things fairly simple. Um, basically, uh, all of our codes in GitHub, uh, the bulk of our services, as I said, are Node. Um, very simple, commit something to master. Uh, basically, we build that uh, we actually build the code and run the tests inside Docker containers. Um, so on our Jenkins box, once you've done the commits, you basically git pull, build the Docker container, and then run the tests inside the container. Um, so I think there was a, pre and a previous version of this from one of the earlier speakers where they built the container near the end. I'm not quite sure what benefit that gives. We build the container right at the start, and it's the container that moves through the environment. So the instant that it's built, it's, it's immutable. Um, and we've run all of the tests inside the container. Um, we find that really important. Obviously, our Jenkins box or boxes um, could have different versions of Node and other things on it. So by isolating everything in the container, what we allow is different teams. Uh, for example, we've got versions from you know, uh, .10 all the way through to 6 uh, of Node running through all these services, and they're completely, they're completely fine because of the fact that everything we do is within containers, not just production. Uh, and then basically, uh, once that container is built, we push it, to develop, push it to a development platform server via Ansible. Uh, and then we use a plugin in Jenkins, the promotion plugin, which some of you may use, basically to, uh, to push that promotion up. So you'll see the gold stars, basically. As we push the builds, we basically promote them up the stack. Um, and rollback is as simple as basically promoting the last known good container. So it's incredibly simple. Um, the other thing that we do at the moment, and I guess we've got this benefit, our scale's not huge, we have around 100 services, um, is we can actually, we haven't yet moved to something like Mesos or a scheduler from a, from a capacity perspective. Basically, every container goes to every platform server. So that's very simple. Um, and uh, obviously, those platform servers are big, and in production, we have a lot of them, but everything is effectively pushed everywhere. So it's about as dumb as a brick. Um, but it works, and it's easy to conceptualize, and it's obviously easy to manage and easy to roll back. Uh, we're exploring now ideas of basically making that a little bit more complex, and for different services allowing us to run you know, more versions of it, things like that. Uh, so how this sort of works for us, um, we sort of greatly, greatly uh, prefer feature toggles over feature branches. Uh, everything goes to master all the time. We don't, we don't branch. Uh, the exception to that is some teams use pull requests, and obviously you get branches with pull requests, but they're very, very short-lived. Um, so uh, we, we greatly prefer to release code to production as soon as possible behind a feature toggle. Uh, any code that's unreleased sitting in either a branch or in a repository that's unreleased makes me nervous, because um, at some point someone will need to come along and do something to that service, and they'll be stuck there trying to figure out whether that thing that you've half-built should go live or not. Uh, this definitely encourages small frequent releases. 
And the key thing here, and again, this is the kind of cultural enabler for this, is as soon as you're doing this, and as soon as it's clear to people that actually I can make this one change, be that a, a, a tiny change to a, a, the way the sort of HTML works in an app, uh, all the way through to something bigger, and actually I can push it to production without fear at any time of the day, and if something goes wrong within a few minutes, I can pull it back. The kind of impact that that has on the culture of the engineering team is immense. Um, so, microservices. Uh, we've used microservices since I arrived at Tez. Um, I've talked a little bit at previous conferences about some of the tools that we've built. I'm not going to go into those now. I'll talk a little bit more, I think, conceptually about how we think about them. Um, we've thought about them, and it's changed a little over the years. Um, but basically, when we started, we started with a thing in the middle. Everything was a service. Um, and uh, you know, we'd, similar sort of scales that we're talking about here, which is you know, uh, services are kind of between 50 to 1,000 lines of code. Um, and then we had shared modules for things like logging, uh, you know, database connections, standard express configuration, things like that. Um, what we started to find was that actually there was, a, there was another abstraction that was quite useful for us, which is effectively the kind of Netflix style back end for, uh, front end for back end type idea. So we call them applications. Uh, these days, basically, what they are is it'll be effectively an isomorphic React app, typically, uh, that'll interact with a set of services. So this will be a separate application that effectively provides that view layer. Um, and what that allows is, in certain teams, it certainly speeds them up simply because you can start to distribute. You know, you've got a guy whose specialty is more front end. He can just go build the whole front end of the app. Um, other teams have, have chosen to keep those closer together and sort of maintain a little bit more of the full stack approach. But we found that both work. So what, is, what does that mean for us? So this is an example of a, a page on our website. Uh, this is a resource, a teaching resource for the big fat Christmas quiz, uh, which is reasonably popular. Um, so this page itself is made up of a set of services. Um, and the, the kind of two main services that exist on this page is actually about eight or nine that'll interact with this page. This is one of the ones that I think is um, deceptively complicated. Um, so uh, we have a service that's responsible for rendering effectively the framework of the page, including all the core assets for the, for the uh, resource itself. There's services that control all the previews and interactions with that. There's services that control the secure download of the assets or the purchase of them. There's a whole e-commerce engine behind this, and there's a service that controls the reviews, because reviews are serviced across the site. Um, and I guess the, the, the sort of architectural approach we make to these is there's a front end that does the aggregation on the rendering, as well as some stuff that's done client side via React. Um, but we very much take the approach of uh, you know, services. Uh, we try not to have services directly talk to each other. Um, we do occasionally, so it makes sense sometimes for a service to directly invoke uh, synchronously another service. We try and avoid it. Um, we typically use message queues. We use RabbitMQ uh, a lot. Uh, we've stuck with a single, single broker model that works for us uh, at our scale. Um, and in this model, you, know, you can sort of imagine a, a, a process which is when you get a new comment uh, that's persisted into the comment sort of service <laughs> database, but actually we send the message out on the MQ so that the resource service knows what the overall rating for a resource is. So when we're rendering a resource, maybe in a list, we don't have to go and ask the review service what the overall rating is. Um, so definitely everything is about loosely coupled services, single responsibility. Uh, we definitely favor local caches, caches, even if that gets out of sync. I mean, our users don't care. Um, we're thankfully not running a payroll system. Um, so, uh, you know, and I think the key thing here is as soon as you start using message queues to decouple things, then, you know, suddenly it's much easier to deploy things independently. I think as many people today have talked about. Um, I think I only have a minute or so left. Uh, the final thing I'll zoom through this is open source processes. So we've gone really hard uh, as we've gotten rid of some of those enterprise uh, approaches around culture and other things uh, to basically just adopt the processes of the communities that we all, were all involved in in our spare time. Um, so we use GitHub extensively. Um, so uh, all of our, everything that we do is in GitHub. All of our issues for all of the projects and services in GitHub, we don't use any other tools. We use ZenHub on top of it as a nice interface. Um, you know, all of our issues are there. Uh, all of our documentation is in GitHub. Um, so again, this question of kind of service ownership, all of that is, ex exists in the readmes of the services. Um, we actually, uh, we should have, in hindsight, just used a spreadsheet, but we actually wrote a service to manage the services. Um, 
It's what happens when you hire too many engineers. Um, but one of the things our service that manages services does, and I should put a screenshot in, is uh, it basically uh, gives us a list of all the deployed services, a green light to say which environment it's deployed in, and a few green lights to say, does it have a readme? Does the readme have a block that says owner? You know, things like that. So we can use that as like a, a, a health check uh, across the whole environment. So, um, you know, everything's online. Um, we definitely favor pull requests over code reviews. None of our teams do formal code reviews. Everything's done by pull requests. Um, we definitely favor a huge amount of transparency so everyone can see everything. Uh, again, we have the advantage here where ultimately we're, pub we're a publisher uh, in many respects. Um, so there's very little that we have to do that's completely locked down, excluding perhaps our e-commerce engine. Um, but even that, all of the discussion is open. Uh, we have a very, very simple flow-based process. We don't use Scrum or anything else. Basically, the teams effectively get stuff in. They work on that, and we release it to live as soon as we can. If we need to sync that up with kind of marketing pushes for big, big external releases, that's when we start using feature toggles and other things. But we don't let that impinge uh, the, the, the speed with which we put stuff through the pipe. Uh, and we do work remote first. So despite the fact, uh, I've, I definitely think that co-located people are, are better. Uh, we've found that there's some skill sets, um, in particular, a lot of the stuff we do around uh, big data and analytics, where actually some of the people I've wanted to hire, they won't work in London or San Francisco. So we've built some of those teams remotely. Um, and all of our processes, we use HipChat, um, which everybody complains about. But um, uh, everything we try and do is remote first. Am I running out of time? So to recap, um, basically, if you use any one of these, I think you'll be better off than if you use none at all. Um, I'd sort of br I broadly, I I'd think of them in this order, maybe controversial given I'm a microservices thing, but you should definitely focus on your process and your people first, because even if your tech's bad, if you get that right, then you know, the, uh, the, the ingredients will be there for you to start tackling the tech problem. Um, immutable infrastructure just gives you that, and continuous delivery give you that uh, kind of freedom from fear that's required to, uh, to really drive the broader change uh, within the business and to speed things up. Um, and then microservices, I think, uh, are just a natural evolution of how you should build great software. Okay, thank you very much. Thank <clears throat> you.